to a lecture on Earth's evolution through geologic time. Okay, Earth is really unique. Congratulations, class, you're alive. A lot of things had to have happened in geologic past for you to be here today and to watch this lecture. For one thing, uh, you know, we have to be on the right planet Okay, the correct size to support life as we know it. If Earth was 10% uh, bigger, we would have a more robust atmosphere with smaller molecules like hydrogen and helium um, or more of those gases, uh, which might not have been able to support life. If our planet had been uh, just a little bit smaller, uh, we'd, we'd be more like the size of uh, Mars, Mercury, or Venus, and uh, for Mercury as an example, or let's say the Moon, uh, they don't exert enough gravitational force to sustain uh, uh, an atmosphere with enough atmospheric pressure to be able to have liquid water uh, on it on the, the planetary body. So Earth is kind of just the right size. In addition to that, the composition of our planet is really important. The fact that we have uh, a metallic core, um, the liquid outer core generates a magnetic field, and that protects us from harmful cosmic rays that are being hurled towards us. And life as we know it wouldn't exist if we didn't have uh, that protection. And in addition to that, um, plate tectonics is really important for plates to collide and to have subduction and to have, uh, you know, continental crust grow through accretion and uh, thicken with magmatic plutons creating the highlands on Earth. Uh, there'd be a, a difference between the ocean basins and the highlands of the continental crust. Um, that's the reason why we have land that's above the ocean. If it weren't for plate tectonics, we could be on a planet, well, we wouldn't be here, but Earth would be a planet that was just completely covered by water, a few kilometers uh, it, thick of just ocean. So there would be life, right? There'd be algae, microbial life, but there uh, certainly wouldn't be human life, okay? Um, then there's the right location, right? There's like this kind of Goldilocks range in terms of uh, our distance from the sun. If we're a little bit closer, we'd be more like Venus. Venus has got like a runaway greenhouse effect, and their atmosphere is thick with... Uh, carbon dioxide and methane, and um, that makes the surface really hot. You, lead melts on the surface of Venus, and therefore, life as we know it couldn't exist on Venus. Okay, If we're a little further away, we'd be more like Mars. Mars has a, an atmosphere that's 99% smaller than that of Earth, and it's only carbon dioxide. Okay, um, We also have the right star, or the right sun. Our sun's kind of like a medium-sized star. It burns consistently and slowly. Um, that's not true of all stars. Other stars, um, particularly larger stars, uh, they go through their nuclear fuel faster, and their lifespans are only about a billion years. If that were the case, uh, we wouldn't be here because it, it took a really long time for complex organisms to evolve on Earth. So the fact that our sun is kind of a medium-sized star that burns slowly and has a lifespan of approximately um, 10 billion years is very helpful because uh, about four and a half billion years have already passed and we're finally here, okay? So yeah, we're really lucky. A lot of geologic events also shaped Earth. All the mass extinctions uh, led to kind of diverse changes in the tree of life with, which ultimately led to us. Uh, about two, you know, when we showed up approximately two million years ago. All right, so let's start off with the history of our planet and history of our uh, universe, for that matter. Um, the Earth began about, I'm sorry, the history of the Earth began about 13.7 billion years ago with the Big Bang. That's when all matter was created, so protons and neutrons just spilled out away from singularity. Uh, and when this occurred, they form the very first elements known in our universe. Uh, hydrogen, helium, a little bit of lithium, just kind of spilling in an expanding universe. And um, as anything that has mass, it, uh, 
it exerts gravity and attracts more mass, so clumps of matter started to form, and those form the very first stars, okay, um, and the very first solar systems. Now, these first stars, uh, see what a star does really is just converts, uh, they're very massive uh, factories or cauldrons uh, in space that uh, have thermal nuclear um, reactions that occur at the center of the star. And so hydrogen converts to helium and a lot of energy is released in the form of heat, light, uh, radiation, okay? And so those very first stars, when they form, they're, they're also like little factories where they can create new elements. See, at this point, the very first stars that formed, the only elements present in our universe were the really light elements, like I said, hydrogen and helium. Um, then later in the cauldron of stars, they started to form new and heavier elements because they created this situation where atoms kind of collided with one another and formed heavier elements, so like carbon, oxygen, and so forth. And some of those biggest stars, um, when they're big enough, they would supernova and erupt, okay? And that would s create a, an event or an explosion where a bunch of atoms would collide with one another and make heavier elements. So heavier elements that we're familiar with, iron, nickel, silica, rocky material, heavier gases, all the metals, those were created in the cauldrons of stars and supernova from the very first forming stars. Okay. Um, and so the fact that uh, you might have like a gold ring or some platinum or silver on you, all that material, uh, all that, all those heavy elements that are present on Earth are only here because of the lifespan of previous generations of stars. They supernovaed, spilled their new element material into interstellar space. That stuff coalesced to form a new solar system. Uh, it's believed that our star is a third generation star, so two uh, lifespans of stars beforehand before our solar system formed. Okay. So our solar system began to form from this huge nebular dust cloud that was mostly hydrogen and helium, but it contained, uh, you know, microscopic grains of rock fragments and other elements and metals. Okay, um, and that huge nebular gas cloud began to kind of coalesce and collapse on itself and form a flat disk and began to rotate. And at the center of this was the most ap massive object in our solar system, the sun. And uh, surrounding that most massive object uh, were uh, kind of clumps, asteroid-sized material, uh, uh, just uh, coalescing uh, dust grains of metal and rock and gas and icy material. Those were the first kind of what we refer to as planetesimals. And there were a lot of them, and they all kind of collided with each other um, and started to kind of form the very first uh, planets that began orbiting around our proto-sun. Okay, so early Earth and the formation of our planet from this image you can see was really hot. It was, there was a magmatic ocean, everything was melting. And so uh, the reason why it was so hot was one, all the very short-lived uh, radioactive um, elements were kind of decaying away and releasing a lot of heat. And in addition to that, you can see all of these kind of different planetesimals colliding with Earth. In fact, the first 100 million years of Earth's history is marked by just collisions of other planetesimal material with Earth. So that made Earth really hot, and it melted it. So initially, all of Earth was made up of uh, a, a mixture of different materials, right? Uh, silicate, iron, magnesium, nickel, uh, gases, and it was all well mixed. But when you start to melt something, then you start segregating the material. The heavy stuff starts sinking towards the center, and the lighter material kind of floats to the outer uh, edges of the of our planet. Okay, so here uh, in picture form, uh, this is uh, everything we kind of talked about so far. So we have the Big Bang almost 14 billion years ago, formation of uh, most of the light elements that are pr that were present initially, right? Hydrogen and helium. 
that form the very first uh, uh, stars and galaxies. Okay, we're in the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy is huge. Okay, its diameter is about a hundred thousand light years. A hundred thousand light years. Think about that. So if you want to go to one end of the Milky Way galaxy, you'd have to travel at the speed of light, which is pretty much impossible for a hundred thousand years just to get to the other side. We're on one of the like outer edges of the Milky Way galaxy. Okay. So we're in like one of the outer arms. All right. So when you can see the Milky Way galaxy in the night sky, if you're somewhere where there's a very little light pollution. And so what you're looking at is kind of like the side of that kind of spinning spiral. So it looks like a uh, smeared milk in the, in the night sky. And we're on one of the outer arms and it takes about, um, for a full rotation, because we're rota we're kind of rotating around uh, the center of the Milky Way galaxy, it takes 237 million years. That's pretty crazy. Okay, so within these uh, galaxies, stars were forming, and and when they formed, uh, some of the larger ones supernovaed to create new elements, right? And then that's the that's how our um, our solar system formed from a giant gas cloud called the solar nebula. It collapsed, started to rotate, it flattened, okay? And as it did so, um, the small planetesimals started to form and, and collide with one another. Um, <clears throat> uh, closest to uh, the sun, we have the interior rocky planets, okay? So Mercury, uh, Venus, Mars, and Earth, okay? And the reason why those are kind of the rocky planets is because um, the closer you were to the sun, the hotter the temperatures were. So though that those elements with the highest melting temperatures would uh, condense closest to the sun. And then once you get beyond Mars and the um, the asteroid belt uh, j just past Mars, which is just leftover planetesimal material that didn't co coalesce into a planet, um, then you get the gassy giants. And, and they're further away because that's where the uh, more volatile... Uh, elements uh, condensed into ice to form those gas uh, gas planets or those gas giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, Uranus, okay? Um, as far as Earth goes, uh, initially very hot because of all that bombardment and uh, heat being released from the interior of the planet. That caused chemical differentiation. So all the iron and nickel, the heaviest uh, elements sank towards the center of the Earth, right? That's a good thing. Uh, because then that formed our iron and liquid uh, core, iron and nickel liquid and solid inner core, uh, which generated our magnetic field, okay? Um, and then the lighter material kind of uh, went to the outer edges and formed our very first crust, okay? So that was, um, you know, uh, lighter materials like uh, silica, calcium, potassium, forming the very first rocks, okay? At some point early on in Earth's history, a Mars-sized planetesimal that was also orbiting the sun struck the earth and as it did so about three-fourths of its mass was added to the earth and the rest kind of just eviscerated and started uh, uh got caught in the earth's gravity coalesced and that formed our moon and so that's the origin story of our moon and then over geologic time here we are and that's our modern earth okay so Let's talk about the origin of our atmosphere and oceans. The Earth's first atmosphere was very primitive. It mostly was water va vapor, carbon dioxide, okay, nitrogen. Um, <clears throat> those gases were trapped by the gravitational pull of the Earth, uh, and they were delivered uh, to those uh, outer layers of the Earth um, or beyond the surface of the Earth and get caught by the gravity by volcanic eruptions. When volcanoes erupt, they emit a lot of gas. Uh, and that process continues to look at that. That's a, uh, an Icelandic volcano spewing out or outgassing. And that's where um, the majority of the gases from our atmosphere come from. All right. And as the um, those outgassing gases from volcanoes were erupted, uh, there was a lot of water vapor. And what happens with water vapor is that if it gets cold, so if it rises up in the atmosphere, it, it gets cold, it condenses, and then it rains. It forms the very first clouds, and then they rain. And as it rains, that water collects in the low-lying areas of the surface of the Earth, and that became our oceans. Okay. 
Uh, about 3.5 billion years ago, and we have direct evidence of this, fossil evidence of this, photosynthesis began in single-celled bacteria. Okay, um, And so th the great thing about that is that converted carbon dioxide to oxygen, and that slowly oxygenated our atmosphere. It took about 1.2 billion years for our uh, atmosphere to resemble somewhat of what we have today, but um, scientists believe that these stromatolites, these bacteria that initially photosynthesize are responsible for basically pumping oxygen into the atmosphere and creating free oxygen, meaning oxygen being bonded, bonded to itself rather than other molecules. All right, and that was really important because that eventually created an ozone layer. And an ozone layer is important. That's uh, three oxygen uh, atoms uh, covalently bonded to one another. OK, <laughs> God, this is so terrible. Um, uh, and what that does is that blocks out a lot of UV radiation. So when UV radiation is coming towards uh, the Earth, it gets filtered by this molecule. And that's great, because UV radiation damages uh, cells at the Earth's surface. OK, so um, the initial outgassing of our atmosphere produced a lot of acidic conditions, and that accelerated the weathering of the rocks at the Earth's surface. And all those weathering products were brought to the low-lying areas where the water was, and that's why our oceans are salty. OK, so let's talk about this. This talk is kind of divided into like geologic plate tectonic history, and then we'll talk about the history of life. So let's go over kind of like the plate tectonic history first. All right. So if we go to through the geologic history, the, the Precambrian um, is kind of like the furthest back in time we go. Uh, this is before um, visible life. Okay, um, it's actually uh, spans the majority of Earth time. About 90% of Earth's history uh, was completely devoid of visible life. <laughs> Very lonely planet. Okay. And, and uh, the Precambrian can be uh, divided into the Archean and the Protozoic. And in the Archean, this was uh, uh, much earlier. This is when there was, uh, during the Hadean time, there was bombardment of all the other plant plantasmals, magmatic oceans, and stuff like that. So that was really early on in Earth's history. So during the Precambrian, pre much of the uh, stable continental crust was created during the Precambrian. So Partial melting of the mantle formed kind of the initial volcanic island arcs and ocean plateaus. And because there was active plate tectonics, they moved, they collided with each other, creating mountains and accreting to one another, creating the very first uh, continental crust. At that time, continental fragments did subduct, okay, but once they thickened enough, then they were able to kind of float and stay on the, on the surface of the earth, forming the very first cratons. Okay, crustal provinces. And these places, they, a, a lot of it still exists today. Um, if you go to Isua, Greenland, these are some of the oldest rocks on Earth. They're 3.8 billion years old. Yeah, they look pretty weathered and messed up. These are metamorphic rocks that have been through a lot. So this is how continental crust formed over time. They assembled into larger blocks called cratons through subduction. So um, when you have, uh, you'll have a volcanic island arc here, right? That happens because this is a subduction zone. You have an ocean plateau over here, another volcanic arc. And because of plate tectonics, these are convergent plate boundaries. Boom, they run into each other. This stuff does not subduct, all right? They don't subduct, but they just kind of like these terrains paste on to each other. Okay, you see that? They just kind of paste on. And this is what how the continental crust began to form is through these interactions. Now, over time, yeah, th this was a long time ago. There's a been a lot of weathering and sediments going out into the oceans, but those created new rocks, and then this process kind of repeats itself. So if we look at the distribution of crust that uh, ages back to the Archean, there's actually still a lot of it around, OK? Uh, rocks that are 3.5 billion years or older are found all over the place in North America. North American Craton, South American Craton, uh, the African Craton, the Australian Craton, and a number of places and in Antarctica and in uh, Eurasia as well. Okay, um, and then when we go to slightly younger rocks or Archean uh, 
rocks or cratons, that's anything in the salmon color, they're there too. And then uh, protozoic rocks. Uh, these are rocks that are 2.5 billion years to 542 million years. Um, and that's anything in yellow. Okay, so this old um, continental crust, most of it, not most of it, but a lot of it still exists today, or that's what comprises a lot of uh, our continental crust. Everything else uh, that's in this kind of tan color is from the Phanerozoic eon, which is uh, from today back to 542 million years ago. Okay, there were there were supercontinents back in Precambrian history. Um, Pangaea was the most recent. I know we've talked about that before, um, but there was at least one other supercontinent, Rodinia. Okay, it was actually larger than Pangaea. That occurred during the Precambrian about a billion years ago, 1.1 billion years ago. Okay, I think I have an image here. This is what Rodinia looked like, or at best guess as what it looks like based on the evidence that we've collected. North America was kind of the center of this large uh, major landmass. Okay, let's talk about the Phanerozoic history. So this is the past 542 million years. And the reason why we make a distinction here is because this is when um, uh, abundant multicellular uh, organisms with hard parts start to show up, okay? And so this is divided, up, divided into three eras, the Paleozoic, which means kind of old life, okay? Mesozoic means middle life, and Cenozoic means recent life. And the Paleozoic was from 542 to 250 million years ago, Mesozoic 250 to 66, and Cenozoic 60 million, 66 million years to present. So in the Paleozoic era, um, this was dominated by uh, the making of mountains, orogenesis, continental collisions when Pangaea first assembled. Okay, that created the Caledonian Mountains that are uh, in Norway and Greenland, the Appalachian Mountains, which are all along the U East Coast, and the Ural Mountains, which are uh, kind of like in the middle of Russia. Okay, so here, this is how Pangaea formed uh, in the Paleozoic. So we go from uh, Gondwana was a combination of South America and Africa. Here's Northern Europe, uh, North America and Siberia. Boom, we have a collision here, and then North America, South America, and Africa all collided. And this is how the huge mountain chain Appalachians initially formed, along with the Ozark Mountains over here. Okay. So, uh, and this this kind of moved into uh, the Mesozoic. Okay. So during the Mesozoic, um, much of the land area was above sea level, okay, but that changed. Um, seas began to inv invade Western North America, okay, that includes uh, a lot of the places out west on the western side of North America where the Colorado Plateau is. Uh, that was once uh, by sea level and was invaded by uh, rising seas and deposited a lot of horizontal sedimentary rocks, okay, and then, um, during the Mesozoic, Pangaea began to break apart. There were crustal uh, or rift zones that formed, and uh, North America be began moving westward, and that created a convergent plate boundary, a lot of subduction, and the Pacific plate and the Farallon plate began to subduct underneath Western North America, and that had a lot of uh, uh, interesting consequences. Okay, so here you can see over the past uh, 200 million years, what had been going on, the breakup of Pangaea, the opening up of the Northern Atlantic, the opening up of the Southern Atlantic, and then connecting together, making our modern kind of uh, Atlantic Ocean Basin. Well, I should erase that, it's, oops. <laughs> it's kind of repeating itself. Okay, um, <clears throat> here out west, so see this is the Farallon plate that's kind of disappearing, um, but this subduction uh, was what created the uh, uh, volcanic arcs that are continental volcanic arcs that were present uh, during the Mesozoic uh, in the west coast of the United States. Uh, today, uh, they've eroded and uplifted, and those are the Sierra Nevada mountains, okay? Um, if we look over here, India and Madagascar were once connected. Madagascar kind of got left behind as India moved northward and then eventually slammed into Eurasia. Okay, the Rocky Mountains formed also because of this western movement of, of uh, western North America. Another uh, notable event till present day is Antarctica kind of disconnecting from 
uh, South America. Okay, Australia is part of the the Indian uh, plate, so they're also moving northward. Okay, but Antarctica was once connected to South America, and the reason why that's important is because um, Antarctica was not uh, completely ice covered like it is today, because warm tropical waters made it this far south um, from both the Indian and the uh, Atlantic oceans. But because Antarctica moved further south, uh, ocean circulation changed and kind of cut this cold circumpolar current, cut off all the warm tropical waters that were coming down to Antarctica. And as a result, um, Antarctica completely froze over. And that altered uh, uh, world climates, and, and uh, Earth got a lot cooler as a result of that. But that occurred during the Cenozoic. Okay? Um, Cenozoic is basically the past 66 million years, okay? The eastern and western margins of the American continent experienced very different events. Uh, the Atlantic and Gulf Coast regions, they're removed from any major plate boundaries, so they were kind of like, uh, like a passive margin, just slowly eroding away with a lot of deposits, glacial, interglacial periods, rising and lowering of sea level. Okay, so in the western margins, uh, there was subduction, a lot of volcanic activity, a lot of uplift, a lot of crustal extension. Okay, in over the past 20 million years, the, the Basin and Range province has been stretching and becoming uh, thinner and thinner. Okay, all right, here are the Sierra Nevadas. Uh, there was extensive volcanism up here. There was some flood basalts um, about, I think, 16 million years ago. Uh, the Colorado Plateau was uplifted from about... Um, uh, sea level to uh, about 8,000 feet, okay? So this whole area was uplifted. Um, and so, and the Basin Range Province, so anywhere in kind of red, is experiencing extension. So tensional forces and fault block mountains are forming as a result of this, a bunch of normal faults, okay? Um, in the west, the Laramide orogeny, which is the uh, construction of the Rocky Mountains, uh, uh, began occurring and was ex extensive. And there was a lot of volcanic activity, like I mentioned, and there was a lot of exten extension in the Basin and Range province. All right, now let's shift gears and talk about life, okay? The first known organisms on Earth are prokaryotes. Those are single-celled bacteria that didn't have a nucleus, okay? Um, essentially, they're uh, uh, very simple. They don't have... a uh, uh, many organelles performing different uh, functions. Um, so uh, they're believed to be the first uh, single-celled organisms on Earth. Okay, And one of the first and most important ones were cyanobacteria. They're just one group of prokaryotes, but the reason why they're important is because they use solar energy to synthesize organic, organic compounds, also known as photosynthesis. And they're largely responsible for putting oxygen in our atmosphere. There are other bacteria that uh, existed at the time, archaean bacteria. Um, they exist in environments where there's no oxygen. So uh, today's modern environments are uh, kind of like deep within the crust or at hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean. A lot of uh, scientists believe that these were most likely the first living organisms on Earth because they lived in really harsh conditions and really hot water volcanic vents, which is an environment which would have been very typical in uh, early Earth. Okay, um, But we have uh, direct fossil evidence of cyanobacteria, these layered mounds called stromatolites. Let me show you what they look like. They still exist today, so they were around 3.5 billion years ago. And they occur as these kind of uh, bacterial mats in really shallow water. This is Shark Bay, Australia. Um, and then this is them showing up in the fossil record. So they basically build these concentric layered mounds uh, in shallow water uh, with calcium carbonate. Um, and then that's this is the evidence that they existed. OK, so these are stromatolites. Um, after about a billion and uh, 1.2 billion years, um, once there was enough oxygen in our atmosphere that created the ozone layer and led to a major evolutionary step. Um, eukaryotes are the first single cell eukaryote organisms showed up. And that's important because that's us, humans, reptiles, 
uh, you know, mammals, uh, amphibians, birds, we're all eukaryotes. This is our branch of life. And what this is, these are cells um, where uh, they have a nucleus and they have a bunch of different organelles that perform specific jobs. Okay, and in the nucleus is where the DNA is uh, housed. Okay, um, these are kind of more advanced organisms than prokaryotes. How they think this occurred or this evolution occurred is, is like um, two different prokaryotes, like one kind of absorbed another, and there was like a lateral evolution where uh, some type of prokaryotes were absorbed by another one and then started performing specific jobs within the other prokaryote. Okay. Um, uh, so that's pretty interesting. But the reason why this occurred is because of that ozone layer and their um, DNA was no longer being damaged as uh, UV radiation was no longer going through our atmosphere, it was being filtered out. And so a lot of environments, especially in the upper layers of the ocean, uh, now became available to these types of organisms. So um, this led to then multicellular eukaryote life. Okay, and And this ultimately led to the first appearance of uh, organisms with hard parts like shells, bivalves, um, mollusks, and that occurred in the beginning of the Paleozoic. Okay, so this was 542 million years ago, and this is where, like, if, if you go through sedimentary rocks that are Paleozoic in age or uh, 500 million years and younger, you start running into fossils, things that you can see, and this included trilobites. Trilobites dominated. Those things were like the... Um, ocean cockroaches, they were pretty small, but there were like over like 600 different uh, species of trilobites. Um, and they just kind of burrowed in sediment, and so they were all over the ocean floors. There were cephalopods, okay, there were sponges and corals. So the oceans were full of organisms. Land was completely devoid. There was nothing on land, it was just a barren landscape with nothing. Okay, it's hard to imagine. But this is what it looked like. This is what Paleozoic marine invertebrates look like. Invertebrates meaning they have no backbone, right? So sponges, corals, mollusks. Here, these are the trilobites here. Cephalopods, including squid, okay? Um, nautiluses are in that same family. Sponges, okay? This is what existed. All right, the, the, the uh, squid and the jellyfish were like the main predators uh, during this time. Oh, and snails as well. These are the marine invertebrates. But then uh, that led to later on in the Paleozoic, these organisms began to diversify. Okay, um, Insects and plants began to move on land. So algae uh, initially started coating rocks like on uh, continental margins. Um, but their biggest problem was um, up until this time, algae just kind of floated in the upper layers of the ocean. They didn't have to like require to grow upwards. And on land, uh, you know, Basically, they'd have to fight wind and gravity uh, to kind of grow upward. So the very first plants uh, and algae that covered like rocks on the uh, margins and the shorelines, once they evolved vascular cells, then they could start growing upwards. Uh, and initially, they were just growing up, you know, centimeters uh, at a time, just from the the rocks uh, and the sand themselves. Uh, but then this started like an explosion of plant life trying to like move on to land because this was an entirely new environment that was encompassed by nothing. So plants started to move on to land. Insects showed up and then uh, uh, f uh, fish um, started to show up right after those uh, marine invertebrates and they became kind of like the dominant uh, vertebrates in the ocean, uh, the dominant predators. Okay, So fish were very successful because they could move really quickly um, and uh, and then that led to um, fish kind of making landfall um, and becoming the very first amphibians. Okay, uh, there were a lot of tropical swamps in the Pennsylvanian. Okay, um, uh, because plants started to move on land, all of a sudden the very first trees started to show up in the Pennsylvanian. And so what happened was there there were a bunch of of fish um, uh, that that lived close to these kind of um, shallowing or, or just shallow environments, these estuaries. Okay, and the way fish reproduce, a lot of times they broadcast spawn, so they just kind of shoot their eggs and sperm out into the water and then they fertilize. But that makes like predators go around and eat that uh, uh, really easily, so the success rates are kind of low. 
Um, and because there was kind of no predators on land, it, may, it, 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 it was advantageous for some fish to take a chance to go into really shallow kind of swamps and kind of lay their eggs on land and like army crawl on land and then lay their eggs. And that led to more success. More of their offspring were successful. And then the fish that could venture out even further into uh, land were more successful and they passed on those traits. And so the lobe finned fish eventually led to the very first ancestral amphibians. So amphibians first showed up in the Pennsylvanian. What's also crazy about the Pennsylvanian is this is when trees first showed up. So huge uh, gymnosperms showed up. Okay, they released these seeds and ferns were showing up. But uh, wood or uh, vascular plants were kind of a new material on Earth. And termites hadn't shown up yet, like termites hadn't evolved yet. And there wasn't any bacteria that was able to break down wood. Wood was like a brand new material, like really strong on Earth. Like, what? what's wood? Oh, my God. So when a, plant, when a tree died and it fell over, bloop, just plopped over in a forest, um, it wouldn't decay. <laughs> There's nothing that could decay. There were no termites. There was no fungus, no bacteria that had evolved yet to decay it. So trees would just die and just pile up on top of each other. Well, that accumulation of organic matter was so thick and then like buried with more and more sediment, that's what eventually became coal. And um, a lot of the Mississippian and Pennsylvanian or the Carboniferous Age uh, coal seams that we find in a lot of places in the United States date back to this time on Earth um, when trees first showed up. And so that's why we have these abundant organic rich coal seams. They're just reflective of the kind of Pennsylvanian age swamps that existed. In addition to that, because all of a sudden trees started kind of covering a lot of uh, land areas uh, in the Pennsylvanian, they were really re taking out a lot of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and pumping in a lot of oxygen into the atmosphere. And so as a consequence of this, uh, oxygen levels in the atmosphere were higher than they were today. Um, and so that led to <laughs> ridiculously large insects. Imagine centipedes that were around seven feet long and dragonflies that had wingspans that were 16 inches. That's crazy. So the reason why insects grow larger is because insects don't really have lungs. They just kind of have holes in their exoskeleton. and oxygen just kind of permeates through their bodies. So if there's more oxygen available, uh, they're allowed to grow even bigger. So uh, the Pennsylvanian age must have been a crazy time to been on, be on Earth with giant insects and trees that don't decay. Okay, All good things come to an end, though. At the end of the Paleozoic, there was the Great Permian Extinction. Um, and this was the most devastating mass extinction uh, that has ever occurred uh, in Earth's history. Um, about 70% of the vertebrate species uh, on land died off, and 90% of all marine organisms. Look, great white, just blah, 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 right, and here's a nautilus, okay? Uh, obviously, sharks made it through. We have them today, right? Um, but this was a, a pretty, uh, you know, uh, deadly mass extinction. Um, and it's believed the, the leading theory that caused this, if you can see there's a volcano in the background, um, there was a massive outpouring of basaltic lava uh, called the Siberian Traps in Russia that occurred during that time. And that uh, scientists think that that dumped an extraordinary amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and into the oceans, and that's what caused this mass extinction. Okay. But what this, what, <laughs> what this led to, I love that picture. What this led to was uh, kind of the evolution of, of, of uh, you know, organisms that made it through that bottleneck were then allowed to uh, diversify. And one of those organisms uh, were uh, reptiles. Reptiles were kind of like the first um, fully land-based organisms, right? Because amphibians are kind of like halfers. Amphibians, um, they have to lay their eggs in water, right? And then the next stage of their life when they're, you know, then they become tadpoles and they're essentially fish for a portion of their life. And then they become, you know, uh, you know, gecko, I mean, I'm sorry, like uh, frogs and they come out of the water. So they kind of spend half their life uh, kind of in water, whereas reptiles lay an amniotic egg, okay, it hatches, and then the young are on land, essentially, 
So the Mesozoic is middle life, and it's often called the age of reptiles because this is when reptiles diversified. Okay, And that led to diversification of reptiles and absolute monsters like this T-Rex and other large herbivores that kind of moved around on Earth. Dinosaurs existed for about 160 million years. It's a long time in Earth's history. Okay. In terms of plant life, gymnosperms started to show up. These are uh, cycads and conifers and ginkgos. These type of trees uh, release seed uh, into the air. They didn't require water, um, so they released it into the air, and that's how they kind of traveled around and, and uh, found drier areas to, to plant trees. Okay. Reptiles became the dominant land mammals and evolved rapidly. Okay. So this is a, here's a, a type of gymnosperm. This is this. A lot of them still exist today, uh, gymnosperms. This is a cycad. So uh, later there were herbivore dinosaurs, the Apatosaurus, the uh, Pterosaurus, and flying reptiles, Pteranodons. The Archaeoteryx, uh, this is a crazy organism at, which is believed to be the predecessor of modern birds. Very scary looking. Look at that thing. Uh, it could fly. It had feathers. <laughs> and uh, we believe, that, like, we're finding more and more as, as we discover more fossils. Uh, this is an imprint. You can actually see the feathers in this fossil. So we realize there's birds. Um, uh, all, birds also sh started to show up in the Mesozoic, along with mammals. Very small mammals like rodents uh, evolved in the Mesozoic. They didn't diversify like reptiles and become the dominant species on land. Um, but they were there. Mammals were there, and so were birds. Um, and, and and so you can see here that you know just the, just imagine like a sandhill crane coming at you with sharp teeth and and a beak like this. This is the Archaeoteryx, the first kind of uh, in betweener between a, a dinosaur and a bird. Okay. Sometimes I think those sandhill cranes on campus, they you know they kind of remind me of dinosaurs. Right. All right, and then again, another major mass extinction. We've talked about this before, uh, the asteroid that struck Earth, the Chicks Glube Crater. Um, many of the reptile groups became extinct. Some of them made it through that bottleneck, right? We still have reptiles today, right? Sea turtles and alligators and snakes and stuff like that. So um, uh, some of those reptiles returned to sea, all right? There's that. these larger reptiles kind of died off. But that led to... Um, the uh, marsupials, I'm, I'm sorry, mammals, the, which that's us. Those small little rodents survived that mass extinction event. And then they beca became the kind of uh, dominant land species. So that was in the Cenozoic, the beginning of the Cenozoic. Two major groups evolved, the marsupials and the placentals. There's a, the difference here, the marsupials are like koalas and uh, kangaroos and opossums. When they give birth to their young, the young are very uh, like immature, and they develop with the uh, mothers for a while. Kangaroos, they have a pouch. Uh, we're considered placentals because uh, we're born within the placenta, and then we come out of that. Um, there's a third group of mammals that lays eggs, but there aren't many of those left. I forget what they're called. Um, but uh, the platypus is an example of that third type of mammal. Um, really bizarre. They're called monotremes. Egg-laying mammals, pretty crazy. Okay, and that's us. We became the dominant vertebrate species on land. Okay, um, and some of these uh, mammal groups became very large. Here's one example of one. This is the Paraceratherium. Okay, it's like a, almost like a, a hornless rhino. But um, see, look, this is a rhinoceros, modern-day black rhinoceros here, the size of one. Uh, this is uh, what this organism was, right? So this, and this is an average man. Look how big this thing is. Imagine riding this thing. Yeehaw, woo, yay. Okay, that thing is absolutely massive. All right, so this is to scale one meter by one meter. So this is one, two, three, four, five, almost six meters tall, which is pretty crazy. This is a hippopotamus. I don't know if you've seen a hippopotamus or a rhino. Those things are absolutely huge. This is like four hippopotamus stacked on top of each other, okay? Um, so there were a lot of, uh, like, there were giant beavers, there were giant sloths, there were uh, huge mastodons that existed uh, in the Cenozoic. 
But then right in the late Pleistocene, there were a lot of extinctions of these very large uh, animals. Um, and there's debate uh, on why that happened is there was uh, uh, changes in uh, climate, which may have caused that. But um, uh, here are woolly mammoths pictured here. Um, but the arrival of humans uh, uh, is thought to have maybe caused a lot of these extinctions of uh, uh, large organisms. We were kind of hunter-gatherers, and we'd follow these herds of giant uh, organisms. And because of our awesome communication and hunting skills, we, uh, you know, ha had a good time for, hunt, you know, hundreds and thousands of years following these herds. Okay. Uh, what's a lot of times overlooked about the Cenozoic era is um, you could also refer to it as the age of flowering plants. Okay, 95% of plants today, um, I th it might be 90%. Okay, just double check the book on that. Um, but they're they're uh, flowering plants essentially, angiosperms, and angiosperms strongly influence the evolution of both birds, herbivores, and humans. Right, because they're the ones that kind of create flowers and they create seeds with um, nutritious material surrounding them, right? Like fruit and uh, birds, you know, they eat the nectar from flowers and bees go in. And so uh, all of a sudden this became kind of like a collaborative relationship. Like, hey, we help you out, you help us out, we'll pollinate you, we'll provide you nectar or nutritious stuff like apples or avocados or other different types of fruit. I don't know why I said avocados, but they're delicious. Anyways, so yeah, so we can think of the Cenozoic as the age of flowering plants, but because, uh, you know, we're so uh, egocentric, we call it the age of mammals, because we're mammals. Okay, but yes, um, angiosperms are very important. The basis of all of our food is based on angiosperms, because that includes grasses, right? And that includes bread and, and all the organisms that graze on those um on those plants as well. 